everybody. Perfect, perfect. Well, well, without further ado, uh, though that's an amazing song and we could listen to the whole thing, uh, we're going to get started on our conversation. So again, welcome everybody for being here. Um, uh, we are grateful that you spent, uh, plan on spending an hour with us today. Um, welcome to PCA's fifth version of our Sports Can Battle Racism a Roundtable Series. Uh, I'm Trendis Jones. Uh, I serve as PCA's, uh, one of PCA's regional directors based in Austin, Texas, and co-chair of our Sports Can Battle Racism Initiative, uh, an initiative that's based on making sure that, that we're using sports as a conduit to remove discrimination, but also creating a culture and sustaining a culture that allows everybody to be the best version uh, of themselves. Um, well, again, we're grateful um, that you are in honor that you guys have chosen uh, to spend some time with us on a very special day, a National Girls and Women's in Sports Day during Black History Month. Um, you know, so again, though we're grateful for that opportunity, I think it's important to make sure that we're celebrating the perseverance and the focus um, and the authenticity and the style and joy that girls and women have brought, um, girls and women and Black people have brought to courts, fields, um, uh, tracks, um, media uh, studios, boardrooms across our world, but also in our nation. Um, though we're excited about this opportunity, it's important to make sure uh, that we stayed unequivocally. Um, the girls and women have always been leaders in the sports arena and that black history is American history and should be treated as such. Um, you know, we hope that today's conversation brings us closer to a day uh, the girls and women are consistently uh, celebrated. The black people are consistently celebrated, not just today or just a month. Um, you know, so during this conversation, uh, feel free to drop uh, any questions in the Q and A section uh, of your screen, and we'll do our best uh, to get to them. Um, so, um, without further ado, uh, I'd like to kick it to my PCA colleague, uh, my sports and battle racism uh, co-chair, as well as uh, an NCAA softball national champion, Marty Reed. Marty Reed. Thank you so much, Trinis. Good afternoon to a lot of you. Good morning to some of you as well. Thanks for joining us today. I have the pleasure of introducing our expert, awesome panel. I mean, it is a national woman, national girls and women in sports day. Try to say that five times fast. <laughs> as well as Black History Month. So when it comes to that, we've got an all-star panel here. I'm excited, excited, excited that I get to talk to you all. Uh, we have Asia Evans. She's an Olympic medalist on our USA bobsled team. It's also PCA National Event Board member. We also have Benita Fitzgerald mostly. She is an Olympic gold medalist, track and field, just veteran legend. Um, and also she heads the Community Impact, the league apps. And we also have Danielle Slayton, our US Women's National Team veteran. She's a TV analyst and also National Advisory Board member with PCA. Thank you all for joining us today. Now, as you know, Positive Coaching Alliance is all about you know, teaching life lessons through sports and providing you know, a safe and equitable environment for all kids to have a positive youth sports experience. So I'd mm -hmm. love for us to start off. Now, if you can each just share with us, how has your experience in sports shaped you and what has athletics provided you as a female athlete outside of the playing experience? Nina, would you like to start? Sure. Uh, when I think about the lessons learned, I, you know, I think about, I, I do a speech talk of talking about uh, going for the gold, overcoming life's hurdles and, and the idea that a hurdle race is so analogous to life of having a good start and overcoming obstacles and having a strong finish. But uh, overall, I think the biggest gift that I got from playing sports as a young person that has served me so well throughout my life is confidence. And uh, I started running track when I was about 12 years old. I uh, had pretty low self-esteem at that age and stage as many middle schoolers do. And I was a good student and actually by then uh, starting to become a pretty good musician, a flute and piccolo player, but uh, it was really sport that had the profound uh, impact in having that success on the track and having it right away and getting the accolades and the encouragement and support of coaches and teammates alike and my family, of course, uh, translated into more and more confidence and higher and higher levels of confidence. And finally, <clears throat> being in that stadium 
um, in, in, you know, running in front of tens of thousands of people, but millions on camera, being able to seize that moment in time to, to win a medal, a gold medal at the Olympics. I, I think about that all the time. If I can do that in that moment, then I can do anything. You know, I can harness the energy, the confidence, the, the necessary uh, hard work it takes in order to be successful. And so I just take that with me everywhere I go. And I'm just so appreciative. I call my gold medal the gift that keeps on giving. Great. Thanks for sharing. How about you, Danielle? Um, I mean, I certainly agree with Benita. I mean, her points are, are spot on with regards to confidence. I think one of the, the things that I learned a lot um, or learned a lot as, a, as an athlete in thinking about soccer as a team sport was how to, um, to be a good teammate and how to interact with others. And I got to tell you, I use those skills on a daily basis um, now that I'm beyond soccer, right? Nobody cares that I can kick a soccer ball with my right and left foot 40 yards. That does me no good anymore. It was really, really important when I was playing soccer. But now the skills that I think about in terms of communication and empathy and connecting to others uh, and listening and showing up and being uh, present and bringing your best selves, those are all things that I use on a daily basis in my job and in my life. Um, and I'm so grateful to sport for giving me those tools. Um, I feel like I have all these extra tools in my toolbox because I was an athlete that I use on a consistent basis. And I call it athleticism as a transferable skill, right? We, we use all of those skills and how are we gonna put that on our resume? How are we gonna leverage those things that we learned in sport uh, as we move out of, out of the sports world? And I think back to um, a, a, a time recently I was working at a job and they were doing layoffs, unfortunately. This was kind of in 2008 in the crisis, the, the Great Recession, and my company was experiencing layoffs. And I remember looking around the room and people were pretty worked up and hysterical. If you've ever been in a layoff situation, you know what that's like. Um, it's a very stressful time. And I remember sitting at my desk and being thinking, I got cut from the Olympic roster. Like, I can handle this. I am okay, you know, I, I, I know that I can pick myself back up. And if I have to walk out and if I get laid off today, like I'll be all right. And so I feel like there's so many transferable skills that I've learned as an athlete that I continue to take with me um, on a regular basis. And a lot of those revolve around connecting to other people. Love it, excellent. How about you, Asia? Yes, thank you guys again for having me. Um, Benita and Danielle touched on such amazing points. I think that being an athlete and participating in sports taught me so much about myself, like through that journey of um, setting goals and, and then realizing that like participating in sports could take me to places around the world. That was kind of a game changer for me because it exposed me to, to different cultures, other opportunities, and just the power of knowing that I can go anywhere I wanna go. And so it kind of helped me tap into this power of belief in that, um, you know, we're kind of like through sport, it's kind of living proof that if we keep working at something, you know, it'll pay off or you'll win your medal or you'll do this and that and accomplish those things. And so as I started to grow and realize the core characteristics and the values that I learned from sport, I started to be able to apply it to the other areas of my life. And as I continue to grow, it just becomes an intricate aspect to who I am. And so I think sports teach us so much about ourselves and allow us to kind of ignite that inspiration to find out where we, re we really want to go in life. And so that was a gift sports gave me. Excellent. Each of you are sharing just the power of sports and how we learn so much from sports and it has the power to really shape us into who we are. We know that girls are made to play and active girls do better in life, right? We know the benefits that sports can bring. However, oftentimes, you know, there are things that keep girls from being engaged in sports. And many of those things um, are some things that us as leaders and coaches can have an impact and influence on. Danielle, at what age did you have your first female coach, if you've ever had one? And how important is it for young people to have an opportunity to be coached by individuals that they can see themselves in? I, I think it's huge. I mean, the first female coach, first woman coach I had was a national team coach. So I was... Um, 17, 16, 17. Um, and she wasn't my everyday coach at the time. Um, so I was 
I was grown, right? I, I was well on my way to becoming um, a competitive athlete by the time I had a coach who um, was a woman. And, you know, I, I think this is a really, really important point and a discussion point that needs to stay top of mind because when you look at soccer, women are flocking out of coaching. I mean, you see fewer head coaches and you see fewer assistant coaches, which means you know, if you're not an assistant, you're not gonna just make the jump and automatically be in, in a head coach. So we need assistant coaches um, to stay in the game. And I think it's so incredible for us to, um, to see people that, that look like us. I mean, I, I remember honestly watching the, um, the impeach, or not the impeachment, the inauguration, excuse me, um, and seeing this most recent inauguration and seeing like so many women and black and brown people on the stage. And as a 40 year old woman, like I had this moment of like, oh my gosh, this is the first time I've watched this kind of event and seen myself on the screen. And I think that's why it's so important for us to have um, women coaches, to have coaches of color, to speak to, to young people at way before 40, right? Like, how can we get to them them younger? Because if you can see it, then you can believe it and then you can be it, you know? Yes, you hit the nail right on the head there. I mean, I can relate to you, Danielle. I didn't experience my first female coach until I got to UCLA in college. You know, representation matters and it's very hard to become what you cannot see. Benita, you know, how can we provide more women and people of color opportunities in coaching and high level administrative roles? You're on mute. You're on mute. You're on mute. <laughs> I think it takes a lot of courage. Uh, unlike Danielle, I, I had the, the good fortune of starting my track career with a, with a female coach and uh, her name is Gwen Washington and uh, her family, my family, we're, we're friends. In fact, our, our mothers taught together and both have schools named after them now in the county uh, where I live. And um, she actually encouraged me to leave gymnastics in order to run track. Now I'm 5'10", just to be clear. And I was probably 5'5", five, 5'7", five, five, when I was start, first started to try gymnastics. So it was clearly not my sport, but I had a passion for it. And she gently uh, redirected me into a sport that was better suited for me and my skills. And, you know, I'm forever grateful to her for that. Passed me along to uh, female head coaches in high school, which inspired me having a female coach in college. And so throughout the formative part of my career and um, most of my success, I had, you know, under the tutelage of a of a female head coach, at least. Um, my hurdle coach in many cases was, was a guy. So I, I was very fortunate. And I think in being able to see that um, and wanting to emulate particularly my college coach, Terry Crawford, and seeing her success at Tennessee and Texas and Cal Poly San Luis Obispo, and she's now a Hall of Fame coach, she was an Olympic coach. Uh, I ended up hiring her to be director of coaching at USA Track and Field when I was chief of sports. So my college coach, my coach ended up working for me, which was absolutely mind blowing. I know any of you sitting there on the phone right now are thinking, there's no way I could have coach so-and-so, you know, uh, me be their boss. Like that doesn't even, that doesn't even comport in your mind, but it happened. And it was less of a boss employee relationship and more of a partnership, I would say. Um, I, I love her dearly and um, always will. And, and we had a great partnership and got a lot of great stuff done for coaches and athletes while we were at track, USA Track and Field. I say all that to say that I think it takes courage ultimately to ensure that we find those opportunities to get the talent we need and, and without regard to gender or race and the best people for the job. Um, and, and Oftentimes, I'm in a company now, we're really putting the pedal to the metal around diversity and inclusion. And it, it takes time. You have to be a bit more patient uh, because the easy thing to do is just to go straight to your network of people who look like you and have the same background you do and just hire one of them. Uh, the harder thing to do is take a little bit more time, be a little bit more patient um, and do something that's important um, and not so urgent. Everything's always urgent, uh, but it's important that we have 
the diversity and, and inclusion at our companies and organizations. And, and you got to take the time to do that and the courage to do that. Such a great answer. Trust in that process. It does take time. You know, it is National Girls and Women in Sports Day as well as Black History Month. So you each are part of the intersectionality of experiencing you know, multiple forms of marginalization, being a woman, being Black, being a Black female athlete. Um, and that can cause challenges. Asia, you know, you started in track, which is a more diverse sport, and then transitioned into the sport of bobsled. So which historically isn't as diverse. Um, how did you navigate being one of the only and did you ever encounter any type of implicit biases in your new sport? Yeah, uh, that's a really great question because my mentality as an athlete, I wasn't going in as a black woman um, trying to make that presence. I was going in as the elite athlete that I was and wanting to win an Olympic gold medal in this sport. And so, I felt like having that um, kind of put me into the zone I needed to be in to start in a brand new sport. And uh, just a little more background, I started the sport of bobsled um, in 2012 and made my first Olympic team and won bronze by 2014. And so in order to do so, I came in just as this like athlete, like I'm here to win. I want to do this. I want to do that. And then um, through that, I started to learn like, okay, there are a lot of other things that come with this. Um, and as I started to grow more and share more of my journey and the, the authentic parts to getting me to that point, I started to get feedback from a lot of women um, from the city of Chicago, from around the country and eventually around the world um, that were kind of like just taking taken back by my story and the fact that I'm going after um, such a, a, a goal that, that just spoke to them and resonated, made them want to um, push for more in their businesses or make a change or inspire their children. And then in that moment, I realized that like, listen, this platform, it stands for so much more. And that became a fuel for me. It wasn't just about winning a medal. It wasn't about just making a team. It was about representing um, the city of Chicago, representing black women. I'm from the South side. Like it was no way you could just have anyone go to the school I went to and tell them that they could be an Olympic bobsledder or um, from some of the areas I'm from, just tell them that. And through um, my participation in my journey in sport and sharing my story, with a lot of those kids from those areas, I feel like um, it gives them hope and a light. And you can see that someone else that looks like you or has been through some of these things can go on to be a bobsledder or whatever it is the, that crosses your mind. I think a lot of times we, um, we kind of, because of fear or because of the unknown, we shy ourselves away from things. And sometimes you have to just stay true to what's for you, especially if a lot of people around you don't get it at the moment. Um, uh, and, and so that's what I had to do when it came to transitioning to bobsled. Um, I mean, going into a sport that's predominantly white, a predominantly European sport, um, the, the more we got into the season, the more biases I felt. Um, I definitely, even from little things like, people's lack of knowledge about the sport or, you know, jokes about like, if I say that I'm a bobsledder, they ask if I'm for Jamaica or something like that, like everything I peep. And um, I had to learn to uh, make sure I was intentional in my responses, intentional in my words, giving myself a time to process what's going on and make sure that I'm not just reacting in situations because again, like this platform has given me a much larger purpose and I don't want let's, to let anything trigger that and tarnish the image, but I also want to make sure that who I am shines through all of it. And so um, that's kind of like the growth that I've had through the sport of bobsled as well. Wow, so amazing. And you talked about, you know, that fear and overcoming the fear. And Benita, you also spoke about confidence earlier. And I know one of the things about girls is that they're more likely to worry about being perfect than boys are, you know? And you've probably heard that the research shows that when women and men apply for jobs, women are more likely to apply <laughs> when they 100%, right, of the qualifications, whereas men apply when they only meet 60% of the qualifications. But what advice would you give to young female athletes who desire to speak up or try something new, but maybe are fearful um, in doing so that their voice won't be heard or change won't happen, um, or it just will be tough and they lack the confidence. What advice would you have for those young female athletes? 
You know, Asia just said something I wrote down. She said, stay true to what's for you. I, I thought that was amazing uh, advice. And you said it so quickly en route to something else, but I, that's why I had to write it down because I probably wouldn't have remembered. Uh, I think that's the core of it. I, I believe, and I'm still learning this in my 50s, that um, ha that confidence that you get from knowing that you put in the work and that you have you know, listened to your coach, you've applied all, every ounce of energy that you have and you've come out on top and uh, that confidence that you get from, from participating in sport, you, you have to take everywhere you go. And even in the boardroom and even in, you know, in executive roles or, you know, entry level roles, whatever it is, own, we, we have a, a, a value at, at League Apps where I work now called own your role. Mm -hmm. And I, that's what I think, stay true to what's for you. It's kind of in that same vein of, uh, I'm a badass, you know, yes, I, you know, I, I'm a gold medalist. I, the former, I've been as a CEO for 13 years. I have, you know, decades of experience now as a senior executive. I, you know, and I'm bringing all that with me into whatever role it is that I'm serving in, whether it's a volunteer role or a board role or a executive job. And um, what I have to say matters. And mm -hmm. that's true of anywhere we are. You, being your authentic self, being true to yourself and expressing what those uh, concerns are, what, what issues there are, or what ideas you have, I think is important. You are valuable, you have value, and what you say and think has value. And we know also that corporations who have higher diversity also have higher profitability. And so they can't get the benefit of, of that diversity if you stay quiet. And if you don't express yourself and provide the insight that comes exclusively from you and your perspective. And so, yeah, having that confidence, being true um, to who you are, owning your role, I think is, is really important. So important. You make so many great points of just valuing that diversity. And, you know, it's one thing to be in the room, but when you're in the room, you got to be able to use your voice, right? Um, Danielle, has there ever been a time where you felt your voice wasn't heard or valued because you're a Black woman? And how did you handle a situation like that? And would you do anything differently today? Um, I don't know. I, I, I don't know. Like I can't get in somebody else's head and say, oh, that you know was valued or not. But I can say that there have been times looking back um, that I do regret. Like I should have spoke up more or I should have, I have said something um, or you know held someone accountable or called somebody out, not in a, in a rude way, but just help educate them. Um, and you know, I feel that way um, especially in, in media, I think media is an evolving, an evolving area um, and an area where historically there haven't been a lot of women on television, right? There ha there's only, um, what is it? I saw 40% of sport is played by girls and women and 4% of the media coverage covers women in sport. And so I feel like there have been times when, you know, for example, I was asking um, for feedback about something I had said and I got feedback on how my hair looked. And at a time like that, it's so tough. I felt like I was in a tough spot, right? Because this is my boss and these are people who are making decisions about whether or not I get to be on television or I get to stay with a company or continue work in this field. And how do you find that line of speaking up and advocating for yourself and saying, you know, this isn't okay. And that's not the conversation we should be having. We should be having feedback about what's coming out of my mouth, not whether my hair is curly or straight today. Um, and I look back on some of those moments and maybe wish I had have said something. And to Benita's point, having the courage in that moment to ha have said something in a respectful way, uh, but in a way that, stood up for myself a little bit more. And I think as we all continue to find our voice, we need to ensure that we're being allies for each other, no matter what color or gender we are, that if somebody doesn't have the courage in that moment and you witness something, 
how can you have that person's back and, and be that advocate if they're still finding their voice and still finding their courage? Because I think this past year has taught us that we still have a lot of work to do and we're all finding our way through it. And we need to, to support each other in that discovery process and really help people who historically haven't had a voice or haven't had the courage to have that voice be encouraged to do so more and more. I just wanted to add, I don't want to take up too much time, Marty, but uh, I believe that the social and racial justice movement uh, that uh, has been occurring and continues to occur here in the United States that kind of began uh, with George Floyd's murder and Breonna Taylor's murder in the spring uh, has uh, given voice to people of color in a way that we haven't experienced probably ever, but certainly not since like the 60s and 70s, right? And uh, I feel like I've been liberated in, in many cases. And so, uh, Danielle, I think the same thing. I think of all these times when, boy, woulda, shoulda, coulda. You know, I wish I'd said something, done something, been something different. Um, and so I uh, actually took, took a step this summer of upon reflection, writing, to an organization where I felt like I, my voice hadn't been heard, where I hadn't been treated equitably and, and, and wrote them a very thoughtful letter in, ending with the poem about uh, Phenomenal Woman by, by Maya Angelou and, um, and just really talking about ways in which I felt like they had their knee on my neck, right? Um, and I felt you know crazy writing it and wasn't sure I was gonna hit send and I did. And it just was such a liberating feeling to me to say, as opposed to say, boy, I wish I'd said, boy, I wish I'd done. I just went ahead and did it, you know? And I felt so, so good about that. So yeah, I just, you gotta have the courage, but I tell you what, it's a wonderful kind of victorious gold medal moment when you actually do say something and stand up for yourself. That is extremely powerful. And you spoke to so many things there and the advocacy and holding others accountable and bringing people along because it's going to take all of us working together to see progress. And you spoke to also the history, you know, um, Asia, can you share with us maybe a Black historical figure that you've looked up to, um, you know, that helped you get to where you are today? Absolutely. Um... I have a few, especially within the sports world. One of my favorite athletes was uh, always growing up was Jackie Joyner Kersey. And she has just like, I used to watch her track meets and her perform in various different events and just dominate. And it always inspired me. And then once I got to high school and I competed at a Chicago public high school, we would attend the JJK relays in East St. Louis every year. And then I got to perform um, and I knew she was watching. And so it just ignited something in me. One of the things I really, really admired about her um, and being able to uh, be part of the JJK Relays was the night before she would always invite um, other track and field athletes. And it would be kind of like this like workshop conference where we would get to actually interact with them and hear their story and learn more about them. And um, to just open up that that world and that that room for conversation did so much to me and even to Danielle and Benita's points earlier like I feel like in sharing our stories we get more powerful and we have that um, confidence to speak up and to do things or to take action it's, it's, it's so many things we can look back on and be and um, want to have changed it but if we didn't go those through those experiences if we didn't have the time to process our thoughts and and find our voice then um you know it may have worked out differently so i think that you know time it happens and through understanding what we're going through and and just owning it and being more honest you realize you're not alone and there's so many other women and people out here who need to hear your voice and it changes um the course of their life it makes them feel more empowered and makes you feel more empowered because uh again we're not alone so um, so yes, uh, JJK is one of my top favorite. Another one, um, actually another two is Venus and Serena. I just think they're absolute trailblazers from the moment they stepped into the sport of tennis and um, they completely, especially Serena, just continues to show uh, the power in your platform and standing up for what you believe in. I think that with her having such a, a limelight and standing true to what she believes both with um, 
uh, equity in sports within tennis, as well as standing up for females and women and black and black people. Um, it's really important for her to use her platform to have that message. And it's so amazing to see that and, and inspiring for me. So those are some of my few faves. Oh, so amazing. Does anyone else want to add or share someone that um, they would like to honor? Because it's very important to recognize and tell the stories of those that came before us and paved the way. So I can I can share a story. Um, it's like I'm excited because I'm on the on the line here with two track people and I actually came from a track family and was the weird one to to play soccer. But my father ran track at uh, San Jose State back in the 60s alongside John Carlos and Tommy Smith. And yeah. I like to joke that my dad was the slow one on the relay team. Um, but those were my dad's college buddies. Those were the guys that I grew up around because they would come around the house, you know, after, after college. And, and, and those were the people he interacted with. And so I feel really honored and um, in looking at the progress that we've made and what those gentlemen did in 1968 in the Olympics uh, and their black protest movement on the, on the medal stand and how we, Still have a long ways to go and the discussion around the national anthem and kneeling and all of this i mean we could probably have a whole day long conversation around that but to to look back at what they experienced and the death threats and the fact that they could not find a job no one would employ them when they got back from the olympics in 68 to <clears throat> we're now in a place where kneeling for the national anthem is is okay and is a form of activism and that we are, are moving in that direction and keeping that conversation going. I, I think about that often. Soccer is a really hot button topic where people are talking about kneeling for the national anthem and standing for the national anthem. And I just, I really am reminded that we stand on so many shoulders and Tommy and John's included on how we're gonna continue to use our platforms to be activists, no matter where we are, whether, whether you have the platform of Serena Williams or like any of us here or a smaller platform than this, that uh, we all have a responsibility in continuing to, to move the conversation forward, hopefully in a, a way that is less far less damaging than what Tommy and John had to experience and the racism that they faced in the 60s that we're hopefully continuing to move in in the right direction, but I think about them often these days. Yes, thank you for sharing that. We actually talk about that history in our sports came out of racism workshop that we do for coaches and how important it is that not everybody has a platform like a professional sports team or maybe a Jackie Robinson, but you know, we can do something with what we have and we can have that moral courage to speak up when we see something happening that's not right, say something and doing something about it. And you also spoke to the importance of, you know, men being a part of this conversation. You know, the, the um, current U.S. women's national team, the soccer team, is really speaking of, out about um, gender equality and equal pay. And uh, what types of conversations would you recommend that we proactively have in creating an equitable and empowering society for women in sports when it comes to men stepping up and being a part of that conversation? That's me. Sure. Yes. Yes. Okay. I just right. soccer, you know, um, I guess the, the, the short answer to that is I, if I'm being completely honest, I'm a little disappointed that we haven't seen more men's soccer players taking up the, the cause and, and voicing, um, their support in the way that I would have hoped. I, I hope that that will improve in the future, but when it comes to pay equity, it's not a women's issue. It's, it's a people issue. It's a human issue. When it comes to racial injustice and the Black Lives Movement, it's not a Black issue. It's, it's a human issue. It's a people issue. And I think equity and um, fighting these things that we are, have tried to, to address, especially over the last year, it's going to take all of us to undo what all of us have done. And it's not going to happen quickly. But there is a role for every single person in this fight of equity, of racial justice, of moving forward. And um, I think it's incumbent upon those who have been discriminated against to shout from the rooftops of 
this is what needs to change. And it's incumbent upon those in the majority to say, yes, I am willing to, to walk with you and to hear you and to stand by you and to stand behind you uh, at times in this, in this fight to move forward. Thank you for sharing that. Yes, it's going to take all of us working together and it's a human issue here. And uh, Benita, your daughter is an elite track athlete. Um, what kind of conversations have you had with her over the past few months? Um, and what advice would you give to other parents that are tuning in now and engaging with their daughters and sons in conversations about you know, being their authentic selves and using their voice for positive change? So I guess I'll start with the, the pandemic and its impact on youth sports. We um, have, have seen uh, that there's been about a 30% uh, drop in the number of kids who plan on coming back mm -hmm. to competitive sport once the pandemic is over. So, you know, 30% of them are just saying, you know what, I'd rather do video games or I'd rather, you know, play piano or, you know, some other activity. They, they won't return. And, and that's uh, a huge problem where we've seen there are health disparities and income disparities that have come to light over the last few months. There's huge, certainly huge disparities among um, people of color and their access to sport and physical activity. And so uh, those, uh, those um, that, that, is, that gap is widening and widening as we go. Uh, again, at, at League Apps, we, we have uh, organizations that are operating on a technology platform to manage their clubs and teams in the smallest community-based organizations, many of whom serving kids in underserved communities, uh, we've seen a 71% drop in the number of these organizations that are operating on the platform, meaning they've just ceased operations altogether. They are not, they don't, they aren't registering kids, they aren't hosting programs. Uh, so parks and recs are, are losing their budgets. So I, I just want to speak to that first, because I think it's, um, you know, when we're talking about equity and we're talking about opportunity, uh, we all have talked about at the very outset the benefits that we accrued because or we, we uh, received because of the participation in sport. And um, it not only helps these kids, but it helps those communities thrive and, 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 uh, and be successful as well. My daughter is a junior in high school and she plays volleyball and runs track. And her freshman year, she, uh, she got injured, so she didn't run her spring season, and she was playing volleyball, club volleyball, and track at the same time, which was a challenge. And then COVID stopped her sophomore outdoor season, so she has no outdoor marks at all. Um, indoor, and she's you know coming back stronger than ever now, but in July, August, she decided she was not going to play sports anymore. She is one of those 30%, uh, and not because for lack of resources, she just decided, you know what, what the heck? She just was so devastated by the second season in a row, having the rug pulled out from under her, not having reached her goals, having these high expectations, working so hard for something to not see it come to fruition. And uh, just down and the pandemic got us all down, right? And so my advice to her was basically don't, don't, uh, restrict your dream don't don't shrink to fit don't uh, keep don't don't let the um, light go out on on your dream you said to me when you were eight years old mommy I can't wait till I win my gold medal you know and I still see that light in her but somehow you know all of this has has dampened it and so uh, you know a couple months of just kind of talking to her not trying to change your mind because at 17, 16, at the time she was 16 years old, you're not going to change your mind. I can't force her, can't drag her out to the track by her braids and say, you know, you will run, right? So that wasn't going to happen. Uh, she came to it in her own time, in her own decision and decided, mom, she came to me in my room one day, just said, mom, I decided I'm going to run track. I'm going to be a practice player on my club volleyball team because I don't think I can do both well. And I think I have a better chance of running in college. And she has a vision of herself on signing day, you know, in the next year, 18 months, you know, signing that scholarship to go run track in, in college. And so, and I'm going to post it on, on Snapchat and I'm going to get 500 likes like she, that, that, or, or on uh, Instagram and I'm going to get 500 likes like that. She has this in her mind. So I guess the advice to parents is, and I'm sorry for taking so long, but this is near and dear to my heart. Um, is that you got to stay patient with these kids. You got to 
keep some pressure on them to understand what they're giving up if they decide that they, you know, for some reason, because of all this craziness going on in the world, that they don't want to continue pursuing their dreams. Um, you could do like Coach Washington did and maybe help redirect them to a different dream, but try to do as much as you can to keep that, that light shining and keep that hope alive in them because uh, that's, that's all they've got, right? And that's what helps all of us live a, a fruitful um, and successful life. Wow. So many great nuggets there. And just thinking about, I mean, the pandemic and what the current athletes have gone through and coaches have gone through as well. Like I couldn't even imagine having to go through that when I was their age, but experiencing loss. And, um, you know, if we think about the over overly, you know, competitive athlete who ties all of their self-worth and value into, you know, their performance or being able to perform. How do we give them some advice to navigate these moments? Asia, do you have any advice for those athletes who are highly competitive, going for the gold, wanting to get to the next level, but you know, are gonna have to face that challenge of not knowing when they'll be able to get out there on the field? Yeah, um, you have to keep that vision like visible. Like for me, I had to have things present to remind me of my goals, whether it be a vision board, um, when I made the 2014 Olympic team, um, as part of making the Olympic games, you, you, the best part is like team process and you get all your different kids, Nike, Polo, Ralph Lauren, Nike is the exclusive sponsor for like the podium and stuff like that. So you get this exclusive outfit that you're supposed to wear once you're on the podium. I laid that outfit out right in front of my bed. The moment I touched down in the training center, I mean, in the Olympic village, from the socks down to every piece. And I kept that visual there because things get tough. And sometimes you have to surround yourself with reminders when it does get tough because we experience these emotions. Like everything is not perfect. I, perfect. I do not want to work out every day to that level. Like it's hard. So you have to do things and keep um, visuals to remind yourself. And for me in this time now, um, everything is virtual. So like it's opportunities for you to connect with professional athletes. You could literally hit them up on Instagram, get inspiration. People are posting workouts, doing live things. You can get, go on Zoom, have a FaceTime workout with your friends. I did, through most of the pandemic of 2020, I worked out virtually with like my friends and it holds you accountable and also keeps that motivation. So we have to adjust with what um, is going on in the world. I think that it's not all bad because you do have access to like do stuff like this. And I'm in the comfort of my own home. So we just have to continue to keep that inspiration, keep a visual, uh, a visuals of your goals and what you're going for and, and keep it within you. And you'll continue to have resources presented that'll lead you in the direction of what you want to do. It may not look like our typical go in the gym and work out or you go in to play a game. It, it, you know, things are looking a little different now, but if you're open to the opportunities and the possibilities, I think that you can still like aspire for those things and keep your goals in mind. Great advice, reminding yourself, you know, who you are, constantly surrounding yourself with those uh, reminders that you're a competitor, you know, and it's not just about the outcome of sports, right? It's about the person that you're becoming in that process as well. So thank you so much for that advice. We're actually getting a lot of questions from the audience. So I do want to ask a few here from Courtney. She asked this on Facebook. Uh, when she was growing up, a lot of communities and youth sports was co-ed, um, at least through middle school. Now it seems that 90% are single sex. What do you think are the pros and cons of girls and boys playing together versus being split? Anyone who would like to take this question? I mean, I guess I'll try it. Um, I think as, as young kids and, and even through, you know, there are a lot of adult leagues and intramural leagues and college club sports that are co-ed. And I think uh, it's, it's a great opportunity for men and women to learn to, to work and, and play together. I am a track and field athlete uh, swimmers have the same benefit. We compete in the same venue at the same time. We train side by side. And so I had the benefit, maybe not of competing in, in the same event at the same time as my male counterparts, but it's women's 100 meter hurdles, men's 110 hurdles, women's 100, men's 100. Like we're there on the track at the same time. We encourage each other and support each other. Uh, and in many cases, the, the team scores combined, particularly uh, at a national and international level. So I think there's benefits of both. Um, you know, the, the, the 
you know, the facts are that as men uh, or young boys reach puberty, that's where the performance gap uh, opens up. And so uh, there are safety concerns in, in many sports, rugby or football or, you know, uh, basketball, where, you know, you, when we just get run over, you know, and, and uh, maybe even soccer in some cases when, when there's contact. And then there's obviously the, the performance uh, differences between males and females that are well documented. So that's why uh, in many sports, you really need to have uh, separate events. But I think having people train together and uh, play together when it's non-competitive, I think is perfect. Right, absolutely. I want to say to add on to that too, like the what comes to mind for me, and I think is so important is for us as either adults or coaches, for example, let's just take soccer, right? Um, if I'm coaching boys and girls, which they're at young ages, they're the same to Benita's point, physically they're the same, but what, how are our biases influencing what we tell boys and girls? So am I telling a girl, oh, it's important to share and pass the ball. And am I telling and encouraging the boy, run harder, take that defender on one versus one. Like, what are the messages that I'm sending? And are my biases coming in to the equation? And I'm influencing how I coach boys versus how I coach girls. I think we do this the same way when you look at young black players and white players in soccer. We say, you're strong, you're fast, you're, you're powerful, you're athletic but you're not the center midfielder who's going to be the, the tactical decision maker. And, and bias, you see these biases in soccer and coaching all the time. And so we really have to check ourselves at the door when it comes to coaching different populations and making sure we really are equitable and, um, and sending the right messages because these messages get implanted at a very young age and, um, they become like part of our unconscious and part of our subconscious uh, as we continue to grow into adults. So I think that's a really important piece that it's super beneficial in many ways to be coaching um, boys and girls together and having that co-ed experience. But there's also some pitfalls that we have to watch out for too. Great. I mean, you're, I mean, we see that even when we're watching sports on TV and how announcers describe, you know, players of color versus white players. They describe the white players for their, you know, attributes like uh, you're crafty, you're creative and those things. And then the dark skinned players are describing the physical attributes and then being beastly or, you know, athletic and things like that. So we definitely have to see where our biases are affecting our behavior and how, you know, we're treating others and where specific roles are being played, right? And where people are getting to have opportunities and impacts all of the above. And we have another question from the audience, Amber Robinson asked, what was it that helped give you uh, ladies the confidence to speak on these things, on these things and also find your voice? Um, for me in finding my voice, it was not being scared to like talk about my experiences. And that came from sharing them, um, of course, in like closer quarters with people that I felt like understood. And then the more feedback I got, or um, if I were to find someone that kind of aligned with, with how I felt, then I would share. But I think that um, just speaking up <laughs> in the beginning is, is really um, where to start. It doesn't have to be, I feel like today, you know, everyone feels like they have to quickly run to social media and push things out. But a lot of times, um, you know, it can start with just having an authentic conversation with yourself. And even with me in pursuing sports, like a lot of the things I went through to get to that Olympic platform almost just became part of the territory because I would just hold it in and just feel like I had to go experience these things. I had to do this. It was just what I had to do. And then it wasn't until later that I was um, sharing stories and people were like, oh my gosh, I had to experience something like that. And, you know, I did it this way and I got this result or, you know, you can look into these opportunities next time you're not alone. And I think the reassurance and the confidence to share your story and to continue to grow and speak up on platforms and speak up for um, social justice issues comes from being your authentic self and owning the elements to your story that make you who you are. Amazing. And think, and, and just to add to that, being thinking about self-expression and individuality, what would you all prioritize moving forward? I know that we've seen a lot of ways we've grown and progressed in sports. So what are some things that you would prioritize moving forward? Benita, do you want to start? So can you repeat the question? 
Yeah, when it comes to self-expression and individuality, how can we prioritize something moving forward to continue to progress in sports? I, I think it's a sports, it's with anything. And I, I started talking about this back um, in the summer because I, yeah, I live in a community called Haymarket, Virginia. It's a suburb of Washington, D.C. and um, near the Shenandoah Mountains. So I feel like I tell people I live on the edge of civilization. So I'm about 30 minutes from the city. Uh, but if you go any far west from here, it's all farmland and, you know, vineyards and everything else. So, um, you know, nice little bedroom community. But, uh, you know, I tell people uh, that the, your folks were asking, what can I do? And, you know, they were so enlightened. I think, you know, the 60s seemed so far away for people. Um, but now it's kind of in your face and what's going on and, and certainly some of the atrocities that, that occur on a pretty regular basis. And I think we have to give each other grace. I, I think that that's the main thing that you can't uh, assume certain things about people. We don't want anybody assuming because we're black females that we're a certain way. Um, and so we shouldn't make that cast those aspersions on people who are white or male or both. And, uh, think ill of them just because of the color of their skin or their background or anything else. And so I think people want to do right by you. They, they want to try harder. They want to do things differently, but they don't always know how. And they're, they're going to continue to make mistakes. They're going to continue to do and say the wrong thing at the wrong time. And I think, um, you know, Asia and Danielle have talked about sometimes just going to, you know, not going to shout it from the rooftops on Instagram or Twitter, but you can have that one-on-one -on -one conversation say, you know, when you said this, this is how that made me feel. And, you know, next time you might want to think about doing it this way or something. Oh, I didn't realize. I'm so sorry, you know, and you'll probably get that back. And that person is a teaching moment for them. And it's a way to express your courage. And so I think giving each other grace, not making these gross assumptions and, um, and, and giving yourself grace too, quite frankly. Thank you. Absolutely. Giving each other grace, I think, is very important in understanding that, you know, we don't know what we don't know. And we have to say, this is something that's not going to just happen overnight. We're not going to see change overnight. So we have to respect that process and be willing to call people in instead of just calling them out, right? Mm -hmm. To have conversations, to continue to learn and continue to grow. Um, I would love to hear from everyone on just like maybe a resource or a specific book or article or organization that you've been uh, utilizing over the past, you know, 10 months, something that's been great for you to turn to, because I think it's important to talk about action and what we can do next and give tangible takeaways for those who are listening in. So Asia, would you like to start with, you know, maybe a resource that you can uh, provide for our audience members? Um, I don't, I'm not sure how many people have heard about this um, it's an app called Clubhouse, and there's an and they have a bunch of different like rooms you can go in where people have various conversations, various talking points, topics, advice they're giving, kind of open forum. And I'm not the biggest on just I'm I don't know if you guys catch this energy, but I'm a little more introverted than people may imagine. But um, what I liked about this app was. Um, I can get go into a room and learn about how to grow my social media, um, how to I can go in a room and listen and engage with people who are talking about being black in certain fields and working or um, how we can grow. I was just in a room and connecting with people on how you can grow participation in sports and um, ways to empower collegiate athletes. And um, and so I say that to say, like, there's apps like that that promote those different conversations, promote the networking resources through the app. I was able to connect with people on Instagram. I was able to look into a social media marketing company. I mean, I've made connections and networking that wouldn't have happened without that platform, especially when we're not able to have the many physical in-person interactions that we're used to having. And so um, social media can definitely have its negative effects, but I think there are certain platforms out here that can help empower you and just promote that conversation and promote that inner um, questioning that you need to do to just kind of better understand yourself and what you want to be doing. So check out Clubhouse would be my suggestion, I guess. <laughs> Great advice. I'm on Clubhouse as well. Thanks, Asia. Uh, Benita, can you share something that you've used or you can recommend to our audience members? I'll share something I've used. I, I, it's a new um, women's organization called Chief, 
and it's a collection of uh, women leaders in, in corporate and nonprofit fields. And uh, they, they started, maybe launched less than two years ago, I'm, I'm sure. Uh, they probably have about 3,000 members now. It's, you know, it's relatively expensive. Most of the time, people's companies pay for it. So I'm in rising VPs and above. Uh, but I have a nice cohort of women uh, executives in my same age and stage and in our careers. And we have a, a core group of 11 women. And we're, we've been just, uh, we've been together since right before the pandemic hit. In fact, our first meeting was supposed to be canceled. It was supposed to be in person in March. And so they've been my little mini board of directors over the past uh, nine or 10 months. And we've gone through all kinds of things together and been able to advise each other. So I don't know uh, if Chief is the place for people, but I think seeking out women's organizations like that where you can find uh, people that, that look like you and going through similar experiences uh, is always helpful. Thank you. Thanks for sharing. And Danielle, any advice, book, organization, podcast? Anything. Yeah, I would say um, if anybody has read any books um, by Isabel Wilkerson, she's fantastic. She wrote the book, um, The Warmth of Other Suns, and just came out with a book not too long ago called Cast, C-A-S-T-E. Um, but she does an incredible job of storytelling. Uh, she was the bureau chief in Chicago, I believe, for the New York Times, first African-American woman to ever hold that position. Um, but The Warmth of Other Sons is about um, the Black movement out of the South and Reconstruction. And she tells some really cool stories um, uh, through, that, through that medium. And um, the book I'm reading right now, Cast, is equally fantastic. So I recommend those two books. The other um, organization I would recommend, actually, out of San Jose State, I brought that up, um, and their background in track and field, but they have um, an institute called the Institute of Sports Society and Social Change. And um, you can go to their website. And I know they have a lot of free webinars that are being offered in uh, the month of February for Black History Month, as well as the month of March, focusing on women and girls. So uh, I don't know what's upcoming. I haven't looked at it um, in the last week or so, but they are um, doing a lot of work in, in the intersection of social justice and sport. And so folks might be interested in, in checking out what they have to offer. There's a lot of free resources there. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing. And we're at our, uh, the end of our time here. So I'm going to pass it back over to Trinis to close us out. But it's been an honor and privilege to share this platform with you all today. Thanks, thank Marty. you, Marty. And thank you, ladies, for, for, for being here with us. This has been amazing. I've learned so many things. Um, even just thinking about, you know, Benita's com conversation about confidence and making sure that what you say actually does, in fact, matter. Um, and that you don't actually get the benefit of what you need if you don't, you know, um, if you stay quiet, right? And, and Danielle's approach about, um, you know, being a good teammate and what that means. And, and the fact that she was able to thrive and overcome and come through moments of difficulty because she was an athlete and what that means and the tools that she has. Uh, Asia, you know, tapping into your own power. Um, you know, the inspiration that you're providing to girls and women and men, but specifically those girls on the South side and, and, and how much that matters, right? And, and just the, the quotes that you all had around, you know, it's going to take all of us and don't shrink, don't let your light go out um, and making sure that you keep your vision visible. Um, and so I think that all of those things are just nuggets that it's going to take a, a few more days for me to kind of digest and understand. Um, but I'm really happy that, that I was here to, to be able to, uh, to observe and experience um, you know, you all's uh, intellect and your experience. Um, so we're, we're grateful for everybody to join us, uh, for joining us today. Um, you know, our Sports Combatter Racism initiative, initiative will continue. Um, thank you for those that have submitted questions. We will be uh, reaching out uh, individually to each of you to make sure that we get uh, answers to those and acknowledge the, uh, your question. Um, and we can't wait for you all to, uh, to join us for our next uh, round table, which will be in April. So uh, definitely, you know, keep, uh, keep your, uh, your eyes open for um, both the review of this one, um, but also for the conversation that will uh, be upcoming uh, in April. So again, we're really, really grateful for this conversation. Um, and, and most importantly, you know, I think that we're able to impact impact the, the young men and women that are, that are competing in, in youth sports. And I, I think that we've, um, we've taken a step in the right direction today because of the, of the example that these women have set. So thank you so much. Uh, we can't wait to see you again. Um, and you guys have a great day.